fact, oh boy, we're going to have so much fun. <laughs> because here it is, dear students. This is the entire semester. This is the entire class, the entire concept of investing in one presentation. The eternal struggle of risk versus return. <laughs> Stick with us. Slide number 35. Over the long term, equities stocks have produced the best returns. For the ma vast majority of, of, the, of the investors out there and the, the investment alternatives, relax, real estate investors. We'll get to you later on in the semester, okay? Maybe you should say the best securities returns, the best financial re investment returns. Stocks have returned 8, 9, 10%, more actually. So I usually tell people 8 to 10%. Fixed income securities bonds, 3 to 5, 6 or so. Corporate bonds paying more than treasury and municipal bonds. And short-term investments, you know, 1 to 3%. Sometimes more, 5% or more, but usually 1, 2, 3%. Mutual funds obviously will more or less, often less, reflect the underlying assets that they invest in. Cool. That's, that's, we can measure these things. They are there for us. And the news is good. Here is the growth of a dollar investment from 1928 to 2023. Okay, it might change a little bit because I, I'm not, the, the sources that I really rely on haven't published theirs yet so but it's not going to change much maybe a dollar at the most yeah, it's not going to change much i know the stock is is, is correct the bonds the one that that, that I, I don't really trust the source i got but i mean they're good but the better source it hasn't published their results yet so my apologies not bad huh <laughs> a dollar in the stock market has made almost eight thousand dollars the bonds have done Pretty well, 83 bucks. Treasury bills, which are short-term investments. In other words, if you'd put your money in the bank, gives you $22 and inflation is $17. So, so you see, short-term investments have barely kept up with inflation. Bonds have done okay, but oh my goodness, what have stocks done? Now, what's the problem with this? What's the problem with this? Yeah, it's a logarithmic scale. I'm a math major from way back when, and I, you know, I understand logarithms. I don't really like them, but I understand what they're useful for. But most people have no idea how they work, right? And, and um, we use logarithms when we're dealing with large numbers. We use logarithms when we talk about earthquakes. People say, well, that was a four. It wasn't too bad. I guess an eight won't be that much better, it won't be that much worse, will it? Wrong! <laughs> Every jump is a factor of 10, not a factor of 1. So it goes 4 to 5, that's 10 times stronger than a 4. 4 to 6, that's 100 times stronger. 4 to 7 is 1,000 times stronger. And 4 to 8 would be 10,000 times stronger. So yeah, a 8 is not twice as strong earthquake as a 4 earthquake. And that's what's showing here. We're not going 1, 2, 3, 4. We're going 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. But hey, we do this for a reason. We use these for a reason because if we showed you the arithmetic scale on slide 37, you would say, what's, I don't understand. Because <laughs> here are stocks and notice it's not until the mid 70s that the line actually starts to diverge from the zero origin. And then you notice that, oh yeah, stocks are pretty darn risky, but we see this exponential growth. And that's what a logarithmic scale does. It turns an exponential curve into a line, into a linear curve. Because notice, bonds, treasury bills, inflation, don't even show up on, on an arithmetic scale. And that's why we use logarithmic scales. Make sense? Okay, okay, make sure you understand that now. You don't have to learn how to calculate them or anything, don't worry. <laughs> but they sh allow us to turn a, an exponential graph, which is one of these wee up in the air, into a linear graph, which is more easily referenced by us. And so let's now take an even longer view Let's go back to the dawn of the industrial age. 
and see what a dollar has done. A dollar in the stock market has become $56 million. And you might say that's ridiculous, but no, it's not. Think about what life was like in the early 1800s. And if you don't really know, I suggest reading historical novels. Folks, in the early 1800s, the toilet had not even been invented yet. Right. <laughs> Steam engines were just being uh, d d developed for the very first time. Yes, the standard of living since then has grown exponentially, as have investments that have produced that standard of living. So the news is good, isn't it? But what does the logarithmic scale hide? These little squiggles here that you see? N -n 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 -n. They're not little numbers, folks. They're huge numbers. Yeah, they're huge. And that's where the, um, the person who's uninitiated or uninformed might think, well, hey, stocks go up in a straight line. No, 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 they don't, no, they don't. Bonds have done a pretty darn well, haven't they? One dollar has turned into almost 48,000. It's not as good as stocks. Why? Because instead of being an owner when you're uh, uh, invested in stocks, you're a loner. You're like the, not L-O-N-E-R, L-O-A-N-E-R. You're lending your money. And, 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 and that makes sense, right? You're taking far less risk, so you're getting far less reward. Now, notice that the savings accounts have done pretty darn well, actually, given time. You know, even at 3%, you can still do pretty well over time. But here's the kicker. Gold. You, you, maybe you thought when you took this class, you're going to learn about how to invest in gold. Gold. Eh, gold is a horrible investment. And we'll thwack it, thrash it thoroughly at the end, near the end of the semester. Um, usually gold is sold by people who sell you gold. <laughs> it's recommended by people who will sell you gold. Uh, that's how they make their money. Now notice, people are always worried about inflation, but inflation has been, you know, over 200 years, has been pretty, pretty strong. But still, if we invest prudently, wisely, with an eye toward long-term growth, we should be able to beat inflation handily. Notice when gold does well. Gold does well when people believe the world is going to end. Uh, here was the um, the uh, Civil War, and then here's the 1930s, right? The uh, Depression, World War II, and then in the 70s, when when uh, inflation really took hold strongly in the United States, gold levitated. But then look, it hit. I don't know if some of you, most of you, weren't around, but it hit around $800 an ounce in 1980 and 1981. By 1999, it was $250 an ounce, right? <laughs> and then it levitated in the 2000s with, uh, with the, uh, the internet crash, the Iraq war, the uh, terrorist attacks, the housing bubble, and then fell back down and has uh, recovered somewhat. But gold is not a very good investment. And that's why we spend most of our time on stocks. The news is good. But... We have to discuss risk. We have to make sure we understand the risks of investing in stocks. Slide 39. Listen, folks, listen. It is no accident that stocks and bonds have produced better returns than short-term investments, you know, cash investments. Otherwise, why would investors assume the higher risks of stocks and bonds? And the answer is they wouldn't, right? Why wouldn't investors just take the risk-free rate of return if it was as if it were as as lucrative as investing in stocks and bonds and the answer is it isn't <laughs> the risk-free rate of return is a term notice if anything's in italics it usually means it's going to be on the test and there's going to be an, an item a, a an entry in the study guide so make sure you know it this is the return on guaranteed short-term investments and specifically when they talk about the risk-free rate of return, they will normally quote the three-month treasury bill, which we'll discuss in detail in our last presentation of this chapter. So if people want to know what the risk-free rate of return is, they'll run to the treasurydirect.gov, which is what you're going to do, part of your assignment, 
and check out three month treasury bills. The risk premium is the reward for bearing risk, the extra return on a risky asset over the risk free rate of return. So here is the risk premiums from 1928 to 2023. And again, these numbers may change ever so slightly, ever so slightly. So don't, don't get messed up if all of a sudden you see long-term corporate bonds change from 3.57 to 3.58, right? My apologies. But the average return for the stock market is over 11%. Remember I said eight, nine, 10%? Yeah, but it's, the news is better than that. It's done 11.5%. And treasury bills over that time have done 3.36. So it's a very, here's our first calculation, folks. You take 11.66 minus 3.36, and you get 8.3%. Stocks have done 8% better than short-term investments as measured by treasury bills. And don't worry, you don't have to do this. You just look it up on the internet. Um, Long-term corporate bonds have done pretty good, right? Almost 7%. Uh, mortgages, kind of like mortgages. Treasury bonds have done a little bit less than 5%. So those risk premiums are positive, 3.5% for corporate bonds, 1.5% for treasury bonds. And of course, the risk premium for treasury bonds is zero because that's the risk. That's the risk-free rate of return. But it might not sound like much, but look at what that 5% difference between, uh, between uh, co stocks and bonds have done, right? From eight thousand dollars to what forty-seven or whatever it was a few slides ago, yeah, what you wouldn't give for those extra one, two, three, four percentage points above and beyond the risk-free rate of return. And again, here's the this is the one they haven't published it yet. This these are the best guys for here, New York Stern School of Business. Okay, so so again, the news is good. Yeah, we're we're going to. Um, get a, we hope, <laughs> a, a premium for taking on risks of stocks. All right, risk versus reward, risk versus return. The investment reward, the investment return is very straightforward. How much did you start with? How much did you end with? There's your return. But measuring how much risk you took to receive that return is much more difficult. In fact, it's impossible. It's absolutely possible. It's not possible. We use the best tools we have, and they are not perfect. Each year, the investment community measures the average annual return and the amount of variance from the average return. Using statistics, I'm sorry, statistics. <laughs> don't worry, you don't have to do any of these calculations. The resulting measures of risk are called variance and standard deviation. Don't drop the class. Come on, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We don't bother to do these calculations. They are done for us. Variance and standard deviation calculations will be left for your statistics, statistics class. Suffice to say, the higher the variance and standard deviation, the riskier the investment. The higher the variance and standard deviation, the more the investment return will deviate from the average annual return. What does that mean? Look, we said that stocks did 11.5%, 11.66%. But in any one year, you're not going to get 11.66%. I mean, that's very unusual. You might get 7%, 17%, minus 12%, 22%. What is the variance and what is the deviation from the average annual return? Now, this is, you know, I put these down here because they're math, you know, these these formulas here, and I, I'm not meaning to scare you. Don't drop the class. No, we, we don't do these calculations, but we mathematicians, we're, we're a smug group, and we use these symbols that nobody else uses to, to uh, denote or discuss and, and describe calculations, and we, of course, we scared it'll even be Jesus out of most people. What is this stupid backwards E? It's agony, actually, excuse me, <laughs> right? Sigma, right? No. Or is it epsilon? I forget. It's one of the Greek letters. But it means summation. I think it's sigma. Yeah, it's sigma. And, and what we're saying is, look, we're going to go through all the years. In this case, we've gone through 1928 to 2003. And we're going to take the actual return, that's R sub I, the return in any one year, 
and we're going to subtract it from the average of those uh, many years from 1928 to 2023. Now, we, we, that makes sense, right? You know, we said the average was 11.6. Well, how far away were we from the average? But now we, we uh, multiply it by itself. We, we square it. And why do we do that? Because if we didn't do that, they would all turn out to zero, right? They would all, the, the negatives and the positives would all cancel one, one another out. So what happens is this makes them all positive. Okay, don't worry, we'll, we'll take the square root later on. So we make them all positive, and then we sum them all up. That's what this funny backwards E means. Take the sum of those calculations. Subtraction of each uh, individual year minus the average year squared, and that's a positive number. And then we divide it by the number of numbers minus 1. Take the statistics class if you really want to know why it's minus 1. And, and that gives us the variance, VAR, or sometimes they use this little sigma. This is sigma squared, right? Isn't that sigma? All of a sudden, I'm forgetting my Greek, Greek letters. That's the variance. And then to, to go back to where it was, we take the square root. We then now take the square root, and that's our standard deviation. That's the important number right here. That's the number we're going to use. Again, don't worry. You don't have to calculate it. We just look it up on the infernal net or the library if you're so inclined. Okay? Okay, now, what did we do with that data? Let's take a look. Slide 43. These are the years from 1926 to 2023. And what we've done is if the um, year, the stock market did between zero and 10%, we put it in this column right here. If the stock market did between 10 and 20%, we put it in that column. 20 and 23%, we put it in that column. If it did between minus 10 and minus 20, we put it in this column right here. 20 to minus 20, 30, minus 30 to minus 40, minus 40 to minus 50. So what we see is a distribution. It's called a frequency distribution, or sometimes called a histogram, but don't worry, you don't have to worry about that. And so, Look, at, look, 2023 was actually a pretty darn good year, right? 2022, not so good. <laughs> and this is so typical, folks, that one year will be bad, the next year will be good, but not always. Here's 2020. Where's 2020? It did negative. I think it was like negative 9%. And then 2020, 2020, I'm sorry, 20, the year, did I say 2020? No, I'm sorry. The year 2000. The year 2000, after you know, 15 some odd years of, of really, really strong results. The year 2000 was the first negative year in many years. 2001, it went from minus 10 to minus 20. I forget what, 17 or something like that. And then 2002, oh. <laughs> so if you started investing in 2000, by the year 2002, you were saying, no mas, no mas, no quiero mas. Get me out of here. But then what happened? Where's 2003? 20 to 30%. Are you with me? You got that? You understand what's going on here? You don't know what next year is going to bring. It might be positive, it might be negative. But look at the results. Notice they are skewed towards 10 to 20%. Yeah, around there. I mean, because remember, we said the average was about 11.66%. Does this distribution resemble anything you're familiar with or may have learned in the past? It's called the normal distribution, the bell curve, the normal curve. And nature has actually been fairly, fairly kind to us <laughs> because many things we look at, the, uh, the height of individuals, the, uh, the, how long a car battery will last, uh, many different uh, phenomenon in the natural world resemble the normal distribution. And investment returns also resemble the normal distribution. So thank you very much, Nature. <laughs> There's our average, 11.66%, 11.7%. But notice that if we use these statistics, standard deviations, we find that almost two thirds, actually a little bit more, 68%, according to, take your statistics class, they'll teach you more about this. About two thirds will fall within one standard deviation of of uh, 11.66 percent, 
and the standard deviation turns out to be about 15% or so, 15, 16%. So it could be anywhere from negative uh, 7.8%. Actually, I'm sorry, what was it, like 19%? I'm getting wrong. I'm getting, I think it's like 19%. My apologies. It, it could be anywhere from minus 7.8% up to 31%. Two-thirds chance. Two-thirds probability. But there's a greater than 90% uh, probability that it will be within two standard deviations, actually about 95%. So that means there's a 1 in 25, 1 in, 20, 1 in, 1 in 25 chance, I'm sorry, 1 in, 1 in 20 chance, 1 in 20 chance, uh, that it will be between negative 27.2% and 50.6%. Yeah, 1 out of 20, one, yeah, 95%. Is is nineteen twentieths <laughs> of one hundred, and so there's a one in in nineteen chance, one in twenty chance that it will be between there, and there's a one in more than one hundred chance, greater than ninety nine percent chance, it'll be between forty six point seven percent and seventy percent. You don't know what it's going to be next year. And if anybody tells you what it's going to be next year, they are simply making the best educated guess or just stupid, wild-ass guess. Swag. If you ever work in the military, you know what swag is. They have wonderful uh, acronym. Everything in the military is an acronym. And Paduma. P picked it directly out of midair. They don't know. I mean, they're, they're getting paid to, to look smart, to act smart. But they'll... If they were honest, they would tell you, we don't know what's going to be next year. This is what we think it's going to be next year. We might be right. We probably won't be. I mean, people ask me, what's the market going to do? I say, it'll go up and down. And they say, well, I knew that. I said, why'd you ask me? Well, actually, <laughs> I'm just stealing from J.P. Morgan Chase. Well, not J.P. Morgan, the guy who started J.P. Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley and all those other companies, the House of Morgan. When somebody asked, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan. John Pierpoint Morgan. Mr. Morgan, what's the market going to do? He said the market will fluctuate. Right. <laughs> so we don't try to predict what's going to happen next year. We just know that it's probably going to be two-thirds chance between negative 7.8% and 31%. 95% chance between the minus 27 and 50% and nine greater than 99% between minus the 46.7 and uh, 70%. So, <laughs> that might make you sad. You know, it might make you uh, uh, think, well, I don't want to be investing in stocks. No, you don't understand. That's good. That's useful to us. There's the standard deviation. Yeah, it's better than 90, 19%. Because when the market falls, right, we get a chance to buy stocks at a lower price. When do you want to buy stuff, buy stuff at, at more Macy's or J.C. Poopies or whatever? When the market, when the, when the, when they mark up their prices 100 percent, what do people do? They walk away. When they drop their prices 50 percent, everybody runs in the store. The stock market is exactly the opposite. The market goes up 100 percent. What do people say? Ooh, ooh, ooh! Is it too late to get in? Uh, yeah, the answer is usually it's too late to get in. When the market falls 50%, what do people say? Oh, is it too late to get out? Yeah, it's too late to get out. <laughs> but emotions, emotions, emotions take their toll. And that's why we are arming you with good information. And we're going to do our best to help you with emotions too. But it ain't easy. Investing is simple, as Warren Buffett says, but it ain't easy. So let's take a look at another view of risk and return. Stocks have returned 11.66% from 1928 to 2023, but you had to put up with almost 20% standard deviation, meaning you had no idea where they were going to be. They're all over the map. Bonds have only returned a little under 7% long-term corporate bonds, but look, one-third the standard deviation, or a little bit more than one-third. Treasury bonds have actually had more standard deviation. What a bad deal that is. <laughs> we get paid less and we have to put up with more volatility. Treasury bills have returned 3.36%, but have had a standard deviation of 3%. Less risk, less return. And the CPI has actually been more volatile than Treasury bills. 
the greater the average annual return, the greater the standard deviation and the riskier the investment. Do you want to eat well or do you want to sleep well? Folks, there's no way to get around this. It just can't be done. But hey, that's something we can use to our advantage. And let us now return to that global view that we said in our first presentation. We saw that Sweden had a much better return than the United States, you know, 3% better over, you know, what was it? Um, I forget the years, but it ended in 2021. And if anybody can find these numbers, please, please give them to me. But what did, what did you have to put up with? You had to put up with more, uh, much more. 30% more met risk. Over this time period, the, the United States market exhibited 16.6%, not the 19% over the 1928 to 2023. So you had to put up with 30% more risk to invest in Sweden. And notice that the, the laggards, Italy, Austria, and Spain, had more risk than, well, actually, Sweden. Spain had a little bit less than Sweden, but, but Italy and Austria had more risk than Sweden. Well, a whole lot more risk in the United States. Right. That's why we are so awesome. You know, we take ourselves from granted. We in the United States, I mean. Um, people all over the world, they know good, well-informed, prudent, long-term investors. They know they're going to get a decent return from their investments in the USA, assuming the world does not end. And they're also going to have to deal with far less volatility. Cool. And I think I think so. I think it's cool. Notice Canada is one of the, uh, and the United Kingdom, they have less volatility than we do, right? Their, their industries tend to be more boring, they have less return, but, uh, but they, boring is good, don't get me wrong. Boring is good. I love boring companies, as we'll see later on. We'll discuss exciting, dangerous, risky, speculative companies and boring uh, companies that have paid dividends for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So cool. Da, 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 ba, 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 yeah, well, anyway. We are cool. We are awesome. We are the United States. We take ourselves from granted sometimes, I think. Slide number 47. So, does you got it yet? <laughs> you want high returns? You's going to get high risk. You's going to lose some money, maybe all your money. And if anybody tells you differently, they're lying. That's the truth, folks. If anybody tells you, and they will, if anybody tells you, and they will, they'll say, uh, we're going to give you a 12% safe rate of return. Eh. When you see these advertisements, you will know that the chances of losing your money are pretty high. And then you're going to see claims like 300% or 3,000%. Sit on your hands, grab your wallets, because they are are telling you a lie and by the way they're also breaking the law and you might say what you know what do you mean is it free speech no no we don't it's not in the marketplace of ideas uh, yes we have free speech but in certain areas medical <laughs> yeah and then in financial you can't just make these claims without backing them up you have to uh, you have to, they're, they're, they're regulated. We're very, it's a very regulated, very structured uh, uh, industry. And people say, well, how do they get away with it? It's because of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is, which is people who are the, the cops in this area, they just don't, they can't do it. It's like whack-a-mole. They, they send these people a letter saying, stop that. <laughs> and of course they don't stop it. And then they send them another, we told you to stop that. It's, oh, yeah. And then when the red letter comes or whatever, then they, they, they close down the one uh, shop and open up somewhere else or something. Yeah, it's, uh, but, you know, this happens in the medical field. I have a couple of links for you folks. A wonderful website called nutritionfacts.org. Check it out. Some of these supplements, folks, these weight loss supplements and other types of supplements, they don't necessarily have the stuff they say that's in there. Or they just put stuff that you don't, they put Viagra in some of them and, and Prozac in others. Oh boy, I felt so good after I took that weight loss supplement. So you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Um, you would think that in the medical world that the FDA would be far uh, more diligent because some of this stuff can turn your liver into pate. 
but no, they get away with it. And if you don't believe me, just look up this one guy, Wade Cook. He got away with it for, I don't know, almost 30 years. They finally put him out of business. Day trading coach, online trading academy. We'll see some examples later on. There's one uh, example in chapter one of a guy who told you he can trade turn, turn your $33,000 into $2 million in two years. That would mean he was getting 25% every month or 1,300% every year. No, no, folks, it doesn't work that way. But no, you don't believe me. That's fine. You can believe these shysters who are going to take your money and not feel any guilt whatsoever. I've seen them in action. They're very, very good. One guy saying, now I know all you folks have something that cost you $3,000 that's sitting in your garage or your shed and not using. This only costs $3,000 and it's only going to make you more money than you can ever imagine. And don't worry about burning that credit card because you're going to pay off this credit card and all your credit cards and your home. Yeah, you think I could make a lot of money if I didn't have any ethics? No, no way, no way, no way, no way. <laughs> but isn't somebody doing it? Come on, Payano, somebody's making tremendous rates of return. Yeah, you know, there are people who do this, but they are not investors. They are traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. Not traders, like the MAGA people. The, the, these are speculators, folks. And here was one of the first speculators in the modern world, coming out of the 19-teens, 1920s. The speculator is not an investor. His object is not to secure a steady return on his money at a good rate of interest, but to profit by either a rise or a fall in the price of whatever he may be speculating in. And this gentleman dedicated his whole life to this and wound up committing suicide. Being a trader can be very profitable, but it is also very stressful and very perilous. And folks, you are up against the best in the world. There is a wonderful book uh, called Liar's Poker, <laughs> and we read from it. So listen to uh, the um, reading on the website in Canvas. Uh, go get the book and read anything by this gentleman. He's a phenomenal writer, Michael Lewis. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to him later on, some of the things he uh, wrote about, specifically with regard to trading and high-speed, high-frequency trading. So, do you want to be an investor or a speculator? We can help you learn how to be a patient, prudent, successful, long-term investor. Oh, yeah, we think we can. I'm not assuming the world doesn't end. We cannot help you learn how to become a successful short-term speculator. Sorry. I've never tried. I don't think I ever will. I don't think it makes sense. And again, I refer to you the story of Liar's Poker with John Goodfriend, John Goodfriend, and John Merriweather, where they attempt to play one game of Liar's Poker for a million dollars. <laughs> Listen, read the book, go get the book. Um, uh, or uh, re listen to the uh, the uh, discussion. You don't ever want to play liar's poker with John Merriweather, and that's what you're doing when you decide you're going to become a trader, a speculator. You're up against the best in the business. Look, folks, can you hit a fastball at 100 miles an hour? Can you throw a fastball at 100 miles an hour? No, you. I can't do that. I only want to try, but there are people who can. And they make a lot of money doing it. Can you hit a little white ball 340 yards down the fairway in three shots? Can you dunk a basketball? Can you sing a three-hour opera? Can you write a best-selling novel? Can you direct, act, or write the music for a 100-plus million-dollar blockbuster movie? No, most of us can't do any of these things, but there are people who can. And there are people who can trade effectively and make money. But it's a tiny percentage of the people who try. There are some people who try to put numbers on it, but the, 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 the statistic you will hear is that only 1% or 2% of people who start trading continue doing it. Most of them quit very quickly. But we don't know. We don't, we don't have <laughs> a a Guinness Book of Records entry or whatever entry for that. So, all right, Piano, what's a realistic rate of return for me? 
After you have taken this class, you will have a strong knowledge of the most popular types of, we should put the word financial investments, you know, real estate, again, we said it's a whole world into itself, stocks, bonds, short-term investments, cash, mutual funds. You will also know what levels of returns and what levels of risk you should reasonably expect to receive. And if you are a patient, long-term investor, I believe it is realistic to expect 8 Nine, 10% over the long term. I'm certainly working on it myself, and so far, so good. And it's been a long time. Of course, as we will reiterate time and time again, there are no guarantees. Once you leave the world of short term investments, you no longer have guarantees. And you've seen these things hey, these investments are not guaranteed by the federal government or any other entity, so you may lose value. Uh, trying to explain to you that, yeah, there's going to be times when you're going to lose money. Oh, man, well, is 9 or 10 good good enough for me? Is 9% good enough for me? Well, yeah, the news is good. It turns out the answer to this question is yes, but there are some caveats. If you start early, meaning in your 30s, 20s, 30s, even early 40s, if you are patient and consistent, if you don't get too cocky, too greedy, if you don't chase after every next big thing that comes along, and most importantly, you don't panic when the market swoon. Oh, is it too late to get in? I'm sorry, too late to get out? It is, it, they're going to fall. We know that. You saw that. You saw the histogram. You saw the frequency distribution. You saw that some years are going to be minus 20%, minus 30%. Some years are going to be plus 30%. The trick is to take advantage of the time value of money, compound annual return. The time value of money, and this is something we're not going to deal with in this chapter. We're just going to know about it. We're not going to do the calculations. You may have done the calculations in, uh, in the Business 121 class, the Principles of Money Management. We used to call Financial Planning and Money Management. The time value of money is the amount to which a sum you invest now will increase based on a specified rate of return and time period. Calculating amounts into the future is called compounding, the future value of money. We can compute it for a single amount, a lump sum, a single payment, a lump sum principle, or we can compute it for a series of deposits, a stream of investments. Also called an annuity, but I don't like to use that term because an annuity is also a life insurance product that we'll discuss way at the end of the semester. Okay, so we're going to, there's, a, there's an exercise in chapter one that is optional. You don't have to do it. At the very least, look at the answer key and listen to the, the commentary. You don't have to do the calculations. We're going to do the present value, the, 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 the inverse of future value when we get to assigning valuations to stocks and bonds. And it's basically the same thing. You look up in a table and you do the multiplication and you, know, you get the number. So what we are going to see when you look, when, when you look at this uh, exercise, or if you don't look at it, don't worry about it. We'll do it again in chapter two. And we saw in this chapter is that small amounts over time at a good, decent interest rate, uh, uh, rate of return or uh, dividend rate or rate, whatever rate, we went, whatever rewards we're getting, are powerful. Are uh, and you've heard this story, but maybe uh, Albert Einstein, the famed physicist who brought us E equals mc squared in the nuclear bomb. <laughs> he wasn't actually involved in the in the in the in the making of the bomb, but he was very instrumental in getting it started. He wrote a letter to the president saying, "Hey, <laughs> you need to put some resources here." He was once asked, supposedly, I don't believe it, but he was once asked, uh, what's the greatest force in the universe, Dr. Einstein? The power of compounded interest, the compound, compound return. Eh, I don't think it's a true story, but it's a great story nonetheless. And so in the face-to-face -face class, if we have time, if we would have time, we would go through the exercises. At the very least, we would look at the, uh, the, the results. So do that. Make sure you've done that. Make sure you've gone through the exercise and uh, and seeing what, you know, 50 bucks a month, $100 a month, or $400 a month can do for us over the long term. Okay, one last comment on risk versus return. Psst, 
Here's one of Poyano's secret tips. Avoid large losses. Where would you put $100? So the first year, investment A does 85%. Woo, woo, woo. Investment B, the boring investment, does 10%. But the next year, investment A loses 50%, and investment B does 9%. And people often will say, well, you want investment A, right? Mm, the numbers going up are not the same as the numbers going down, dear students. The first year, your $100 would become $185 in investment A and $110 in investment B. The next year, your $185 becomes $92.50, whereas investment B just does $120. You see, avoid large losses. And sometimes they're going to be pretty large. If you follow the concepts and te techniques that we use here, they shouldn't be that large, like a 50%, but sometimes they will be, you know, very, very rarely for, for our investments. But, but uh, other investments, yeah, other stocks, oh yeah, 50% is nothing. Oh, goodness gracious. It's going to happen, folks. <laughs> I, can't, I wish I could, you know, tell you the, the, the honest, the, the, that the truth is that stocks don't go down. They do. And even bonds go down from time to time. It's rare, but it happens. So. Now, before we embark on the process of identifying and familiarizing ourselves with the longer term, higher yielding investments, such as stocks, bonds, let us learn how and where to park our money using short term investments. Yeah, let's get them out of the way because they're important, but only when we need the money in the short term. But wait a second, whoa, whoa, one more time. The great, this is going to be on the exam, folks, all right? <laughs> the greater the variance and standard deviation of the annual average returns of investment, A, the greater the risk, the more volatile. B, the lesser the risk, the less volatile. There is no correlation, no relationship. Or D, standard what? I always hated statistics. Look, folks, don't get this one wrong on the exam. It's bad for my self-esteem, <laughs> My wife and I, she taught social work for many years. We commiserate on the most simplest things that we're trying to get across. And people sometimes just, just poof, they, just, they, they, they forget about them or just don't bother to learn them. Yeah, you want high returns, you're going to get higher risk. As measured by standard deviation and variance, which we know beforehand are imperfect measures at best. There are other measures that are even worse. But just realize that there's going to be times when we lose our money. And those times we're going to take advantage of. How? You're going to learn about a wonderful technique called dollar cost average, where you just keep putting 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever you can afford into the investment every month, even when the market goes down, even when the market goes up. And assuming the world doesn't end and your investments are prudent, long-term oriented, you should do well, but there are no guarantees. Are you getting an education? Are some of the clouds parting about what the hell are they talking about? Relax, we've got a whole lot more to learn, but you're on your way to becoming an official investment guru. We are so proud of you. Now, <clears throat> in our last presentation, we'll discuss short-term investments. Get them out of the way. They're important if we need the money in the short term. But if we have money that's not going not gonna to touch for many years, don't give it to the banker, okay? Don't lend it to the banker. See you in our last presentation for Chapter 1, where we discuss short-term investments.